keeping with the in keeping with the um, industry's theme, I've broken my presentation up into two main parts. That's hindsight and foresight. For hindsight, as we've just finished the Velvet Five Year Industry Strategic Intent, which was finishing in uh, 2014, it's a great chance for us to be able to sit back and think, you know, did we actually achieve everything we sort of set out to, to achieve, um, uh, to, to what we wanted to achieve? And in foresight, it's really looking at that um, current market situation to get a better understanding of what's going to happen in, in the future. So, on to hindsight. The situation that we're faced with in 2008 and 2009 was pretty dire. And look, I know I've put this up many times since I started in 2008, but it shows that, um, that picture pretty, um, pretty horrifically, I guess, of where we were at uh, whilst, that, um, whilst that new strategic intent was written. The basic problem of the industry, uh, of the situation in 2008, and I quote, taken directly from that strategic intent, was being a large supplier of an unfinished commodity into a historically small and single market within in the small market continues to result in volatility that you've just seen. This is made worse by a supply chain uh, that does not value transparency, barriers to market access, and industry fragmentation. So you can see it was a pretty, pretty hard-hitting uh, look at the industry as, um, as we were. So we set out and we, um, and we wrote the new Velvet Industry Strategic Intent from uh, 2009 to 2014, and the, the top three key pillars of that intent was around freedom to operate, improving market access, and to protect and grow our core markets. And, and so let's just have a look at the progress that we've made against those objectives. The first and most important pillar was, uh, was freedom to operate. Freedom to operate is about strategies to protect the future of, 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 our, uh, of being able to valve it and, and sell it. And, and a, basic, um, a basic measure of success is, I guess, that we're still operating here today, but a more sophisticated measure of success is how we can uh, manage the industry by keeping ahead of the game. Um, and we continue to look on the horizon through the National Velvet Standards Body as, as one really effective mechanism uh, to manage animal welfare particularly, but also you know, food safety standards. And one example of keeping ahead of the game was the introduction of the Velvet Status Declaration Form to try and declare that a velvet has been produced in a safe manner for human consumption. And the implementation, so, so this is a trial and, and the implementation, the feedback that we've received to date is that it's gone really well. So it's a chance to sort of thank all the producers and the buyers in the, in, in the room here for making it a success in this sort of initial, initial rollout. The next pillar is improved market access. Uh, so let's break these up into three core markets. And look, again, I, I've sort of been in front of the room talking about this many times. Do I have any volunteers from the audience of, of what our top three markets are? Steve, <laughs> I'll ask you a question before you ask me one. So, well, I'll, I'll cover them quickly. South Korea, China, and Taiwan. So they're, they're our core markets. They're the more knowing, the more understanding of velvet. They're also very affluent and, um, and, and sort of very quickly expanding. So in 2009, just after, um, well, just before we had written the um, Velvet Industry Strategic Intent, we, uh, sorry, in 2008, we had signed a free trade agreement with China, which is great at reducing tariff lines for those that got access, but it took a lot of hard work and pressure to get access for our industry's most important product, venison. So three years ago, Andy McFarlane in the Wanaka Conference uh, held up our China strategy document around market regulations and market access, and the first and most important um, step of that was to get meat plant listings from the one that was sort of listed. Now, up there, there, there are sort of four numbers that are up there, but there was one that was effectively um, killing deer at the time, and this was how the situation looked if you went onto the AQSIQ website, which is um, the, uh, the customs, the main sort of customs in Beijing website, which allows or li publicly lists um, any abattoir sort of around the world that can export um, different species. So from 2008, 2009, we're in a situation that we're, we had signed this wonderful free trade agreement and tariffs were reducing, but we didn't have access. So we did a lot of hard work and in, in, um, uh, a lot of discussion with MPI, a lot of um, pressure to try and, um, try and get this resolved. And it was brilliant last year when we saw this um, sort of really major tranche of, um, of abattoirs getting listed. 
uh, which effectively gave us about 80% um, you know, potential market access. Now, um, I think uh, Sharon um, was really correct when we look at this. I mean, there is market potential out there, but we need to, we need to be really mindful of um, you know, this, this isn't going to change the industry overnight. We need to sort of educate a, a whole market in terms of almost a new category or new product because that, that understanding just isn't there at the moment. But at least it gives us this chance to be able to approach this market um, because we do know that it could be quite significant if we get the story right. Now with Velvet, the, um, the story was quite different. So straight after the FTA was signed, um, we saw an, an immediate uh, benefit for Velvet. And what this meant for us as an industry is it meant we weren't reliant on that one small single market being the Korean oriental medicine doctor market. And I, I come back to the oriental medicine doctor market because um, there is another market that, that we talk about many times, and this is this healthy foods market within Korea. But this took that away and, and provided a bit of, um, in terms of our over-reliance on the oriental medicine doctor market, and, um, and provided some competitive tension as well. And you can note, I mean, that's the red bar before FDA, after FDA. Before FDA was just under uh, 5 million bucks in 2008. Today, that figure is just under 25 million bucks worth of um, direct exports to China. On to Taiwan. Uh, market access into Taiwan has long been blamed at holding the market um, back in terms of development. Uh, in December 2012, a free trade agreement uh, was signed between New Zealand and Taiwan, known as ANSTEC. Uh, and while the phase-out period for frozen velvet is, is longer than we had hoped for at, um, at 12 years, we can already start to see the benefit that a full year's trading has given us. Again, it's trebled our um, velvet exports to this, uh, to this market. So that's another great win for the industry. South Korea, our main market. Um, finally, two weeks, uh, two months ago, an FTA was signed, and um, and so that that's just absolutely brilliant. This FTA showed our strengthening in relationship, and it also meant that we could show some of our cultural traditions as well. Again, as um, as negotiators went on to uh, get an agreement across the line, we were certainly very thrilled because it, you know at one stage it really did, did look like um, that agreement wasn't going to occur because of a breakdown around sort of agricultural products, although. Um, although it's not as comprehensive as other free trade agreements that New Zealand has concluded, the deer industry does get some benefit. It actually gets quite a bit of benefit. During the FTA rounds, we were in regular contact with our negotiating team at Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Once it became apparent that the Australian and Canadian agreements missed out on velvet altogether across the board, we needed to become quite innovative as, a, um, as an industry on how we're going to approach this to ensure that we did get benefit uh, for us and particularly for our main market. We got as close as we could to the local deer industry to lessen their opposition to the free trade agreement and made such a good job that they were quoted within their own publications as looking forward to working with the, with the New Zealand deer industry. However, their nego own negotiators didn't really listen to them, but rather a, a governing um, livestock body, uh, and it became quite a political football. We then asked Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade whether we could split out the product lines. And this was, I mean, it's quite a big ask. So negotiations are taken down to six lines within an HS code, which is the standard or internationally recognised um, uh, code. And, and to, to ask them to negotiate further than that is, is quite a big ask and certainly a lot of work for our um, negotiators. We said that if they thought, and I'm not saying our guys thought, but the Korean negotiators thought that the problem was a competitive problem against their own industry. We'd already said to them that they seemed fine with this, but if they thought the problem was fresh velvet sales off farm, can we get some benefit, please, for processed velvet in New Zealand? Um, so, so obviously that, uh, that happened, and that was you know, really brilliant. It gives us a really good um, and much needed boost to our processing industry. Um, and, and more importantly, it actually gives us significant advantage over the Canadian, Australian, and the recently concluded Chinese agreement. So this is a competitive advantage. This is you know, really meaningful when you're talking about 20%. The final, uh, the final pillar I'd like to discuss is we review the velvet industry strategic intent is to protect and grow poor mar um, core markets. And this has perhaps been one of the most meaningful and rewarding wins, and a great reason why we have uh, Dr. Chung here today. 
For us, this became a key driver uh, to get closer to, to consumers and to um, you know, really importantly improve their supply, you know, the integrity of the supply chain uh, through working with companies like KGC and other healthy food companies. We're starting to see more more promotion of the provenance of New Zealand Velvet at point of sale and really starting to get that New Zealand story across. We are proud to have partnerships in place, partnership agreements with KGC and with other healthy food companies who are also keen to use New Zealand Velvet in their products with their branding. Now our largest, our largest and most important customer at the moment today is KGC. At this stage, I, sh I really do want to clarify where our relationship as Deer Industry New Zealand is, and that's around market and product development. The commercial relationship is with Provalco Cooperative Limited, as Dr Chung pointed out. So Dr Chung has been talking about the research side of things, so he's talking about um, 19 products at the moment uh, within their wonderful organisation, and he's talking about new products coming on stream. And this is a, a photograph, the, I think this is, these are life size, you can see the stage on the left hand side at the um, launch of Chung Nok Sum, which they launched uh, toward the end of last year at their launch party. And, um, uh, and what was also accompanied was, um, was a little bit of an advertising feature. <laughs> 정관장 장인정신이 만든 고집스러운 원칙 지름길은 없습니다 바른 길로 갑니다 녹용도 예외는 아닙니다 정관장의 원칙이 천녹삼의 원칙이 됩니다 원칙을 세우다 정관장 this video goes on to talk about New Zealand and Nogyong, or Velvet, and demonstrates that this magnificent company is very serious about New Zealand Velvet. What the experience in Korea has taught us is how we approach the Chinese market, and we're already starting to see some progress um, that our strategy, we're using the right strategy, and we're starting to engage with more Chinese food companies keen to develop New Zealand Velvet products within their stable. They also look, we also continue to look around clarifying the regulatory pathway and we have a number of strategies to deal with this. So before we move on to foresight, we need to ask where are we now as an industry? Along with the rise in New Zealand velvet consumption in China, the healthy food sector in Korea has helped, helped to underpin some stability here for us producers in New Zealand. In tallying up feedback from marketers and exporters, we would easily estimate that at least 20% of New Zealand's production goes into um, healthy foods today. This takes a serious amount of volume away from traders. Traders who don't add any value but just simply make money by on-trading products. 20% is 100 tonnes. But this still does leave the majority or 80% of our velvet exposes, exposed to forces beyond pure economics. We need to keep pushing this percentage up and, um, and, and work with more healthy food companies and, and um, who treat our velvet with great respect in the market. On the positive, and as all velvet producers in this room know, we have had a bloody good season. From my perspective, and what is really pleasing is that this great season hasn't happened on the back of a poor season. Instead, it's happened on the back of six years of relative stability, with the last three years seeing decent improvements year on year. Furthermore, one of the most tangible aspects I can show you is the exports as reported by St Statistics New Zealand for the year ending March 2015, showing a 14-year high in velvet exports at just over $37 million, up $10 million from last year, and a very solid growth over the past three years. So as of today, the velvet industry is in a very good shape. However, when we start looking at foresight and what's happening, at a recent meeting of velvet buyers, processors and exporters, there were some potential risks raised. While the price of velvet has increased to producers here in New Zealand, um, similar increases were not experienced in the markets of South Korea and China. In China, the tip market was actually reported to decrease by about 20% in value over the season. Comparable traditional Chinese medicine ingredients such as cordyceps halved in price over the years as the Chinese government crackdown on luxury goods took effect. In Korea, our traditional oriental medicine doctor market 
um, continued to come under pressure, as I reported last year, which only confirms that we're taking the correct pathway around the healthy functional food market six years ago. But whilst we're talking about market risks, I'm going to come back to this slide here. Now, as we look at this, and we can be pretty happy with that, with that line, particularly towards the end, and we're, we're talking with companies about trying to invest millions of dollars in terms of market research and um, product development and, and a whole marketing strategy. That line, that red line toward the end, is, a, is an estimate based upon feedback from some of the exporters, doesn't show stability to them, it shows volatility. And we have to be really careful about what's going on here in the market. So that's something that, that I would definitely be a little bit concerned about at the moment. The biggest risk to, to our industry is around supply side risk. Uh, the increases in the prices over the last few years has recently got people quite interested in velvet production, particularly as some of the other livestock uh, segments aren't too flash currently. And although it's great to see our industry growing, we don't know where that supply and demand relationship is. Well, today we know that the supply, that supply and demand relate, well, we, sorry. Well, today we know that the supply and demand balance is in our favour. If production grows faster than we can grow consumption, then that balance will shift. Over the last decade, production has halved in Korea to under 100 tonnes, been demolished in North America, and bottomed out in China. However, there are rumours of potential growth in China in the coming season. I should note, though, and I want to make sure this is really important for people to understand, that we would estimate current consumption is over 1,400 tonnes, and that's the figure that we should be focused on. And we are confident that demand is growing, but production growth should keep, um, keep in check with, with consumption growth and not outpace it if we wanted to see continued stability. And there are fantastic opportunities, and I've just been going through the healthy food side of things. I truly believe this is where we, where we need to continue. In China, velvet consumption generally has been reported as increasing. So we talk about that valuable, that um, top end tip market is decreasing. The overall Chinese consumption is increasing. And although it's well documented that the Chinese economy is cooling, it is still growing. So this year, the, the they're predicting that um, uh, GDP growth will be around 7%, and looking 10 years out, they're predicting 5.5%. This is the type of growth that Western countries would absolutely love to get. So my final comments. As the Velvet Marketing Manager for your industry good organisation, I'm extremely proud to be standing here today. The velvet industry has come a remarkably long way over the last six years, but there is still much work to do to mitigate the market and supply side risks. Today, things are looking really, really good. We just have to make sure that this continues into the future while continuing to grow as an industry. Thank you very much.